Praise the King. Father, we thank you and praise you. Lord, we thank you for another opportunity to talk about you and to tell about your miracles and to listen to the wonderful things you do and this precious daughter of yours, how she got healed four years ago. And now, Lord, she's come back for another shot. Praise the Lord. That last one lasted her for four years. So, Lord, we thank you. We thank you, Lord, that the Word of God will last us forever. When we learn how to stand on the Word, we praise you and worship you and thank you, Father, for the privilege to get in your Word tonight and learn some things about you. And we give you all the praise and the glory and the honor for the privilege to be your children and for you to give us the mighty things you've given us under this new covenant that we have, this magnificent covenant that we have with you in these last days where you've given us all things. And Lord, we praise you and thank you for today. Bless us as we study and talk about your word tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> praise the King. Okay, let's come to the Word of God, and we're going to go to Matthew chapter 7 tonight, verse 7. Chapter 7, verse 7. That's where we're going to start in our discussion of the Word of God tonight, Matthew 7, 7. We're going to see what we can do in getting through part of this chapter. There's some very, very, very good stuff in here. And I am completely convinced now, after studying this book and seeing what it says, uh, that we are living in a state of unbelief. Oh, I got to tell you this praise report. Oh, praise God. I asked for praise reports a while ago and I almost forgot. Last night, last night, we were at the minister center working and, uh, and Cheryl brought me a letter that a lady had written uh, and said, I've been listening to your stuff. She said, I've been at home in bed for the last two years and said, uh, I need prayer. And so Cheryl said, you need to call her. So she gave me the name and the phone number. So I called the lady, uh, I don't know, eight or nine or 10 o'clock last night, whatever it was, the time I got around to that, I called her and I'm in my office and just me and, and the Lord and I called her and I, I said, ma'am, I understand that you're, you're down. She said, yes. I said, how long have you been down? She said, two years. I said, well, are you a Christian? Oh yeah. I said, uh, are you married? She said, oh yeah. And I said, your husband a good Christian? She said, well, he's fair. You know, he goes to church some, not all the time. But she said, I hadn't been able to go to church in two years. She said, since I've become handicapped and I got this excruciating pain in my back all the time. And so she said, they've x-rayed me, they've checked me, and they can't figure out what it is. So they don't know what it is, so they don't know how to treat it. So they've tried several things, but nothing works. She said, now about six months after I came down with this, there was an evangelist came to our Assembly of God Church and they did put me in a wheelchair and took me down there and he prayed for me, but nothing happened. So he told me I didn't have enough faith. So she said, uh, I guess I didn't have, but she said, because I didn't get anything. But she said, I heard you on GLC. She said, I found you on the internet and I can listen to you on GLC and I've been listening to you. And so she said, I contacted your ministry center and you sent me free and postpaid some wonderful discs that I've been watching. And she said, I'm writing all those scriptures down and I'm memorizing all those scriptures. And she said, I have repented of every sin known and unknown that I've ever committed in my life since I got saved. I said, well, woman, you're on the right track. You're on, you know, you're on the right track. This is what God requires. So I, she said, but I'm still in bed. And she said, I hadn't been able to get out. I said, well, if your husband just goes to church once in a while, it's obvious that your priest is not able to stand in faith for you. But I said, I'm a pastor and I'm going to stand in faith for you as your priest over the telephone. I said, don't you think it's time you get healed? She said, I would love to be healed and free of this pain. I said, Jesus died on the cross to pay the price so that once you repented of every sin known and unknown, there's not a demon in hell can stop us from getting you healed. I said, now, I am fixing to quote some scriptures. I'm going to cast this demon of hell out of you, and then I'm going to pray the prayer of faith for you, and the king of the universe, his name Jesus, is going to heal your back. And I did that, and when I said, thank you, Lord, she says, my pain just left. She said, my pain just left. You know exactly, don't you? My pain just left. I said, well, get over to the side of the bed, get up, stand up, and walk. 
and she scooted over to the side of the bed and the woman stood up and walked all over her room last night with no pain, completely healed. Is that a praise report? Thank you, Jesus. So after, I, after she was, you know, I didn't really want to hang up, you know, I was wanting to just talk to her, you know, and continue to build her faith because she was so happy she was walking with no pain. So when I finally did hang the phone up, of course, I run out and told Dave and Yesha. And then I run back to back and told Cheryl, you know. And, of course, at 1.30 this morning, I was still talking about this. I was still jumping up and down. Every time I'd walk, I'd finally about 1.30, quarter to 2, I said, well, I'm going over to the house and take a shower and go to bed. Cheryl said, there ain't no use in you going over and go to bed. There ain't no way you can go to sleep. And she said, you're hyper. I, she said, you're so hyper. I said, well, I got to get some sleep because I got to work tomorrow. I got things to do. But, I mean... Do we love serving Jesus or do we love serving Jesus? I ain't never had so much fun in my life as I have serving Jesus. And it, it's just wonderful to see the king do these wonderful things. But praise the king. Okay, let's, let's look at some of these things he says here. Because of that, that's one of the reasons I want to start out here in Matthew 7, 7. Now think about this, folks. Here we are Christians. We're children of the king. And he made these promises to you and me. And we don't claim them, do we, Michael? But look at what he says here. Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone. What? Everyone? Everyone that asks receives. And he that seeketh findeth. And to him that knocks it shall be opened. What in the world do you do with something like that? You allow the devil to do the same thing to you he done to me all those years. The beast, you know, you'll see that scripture and you'll start to say, well, Lord, I guess I could ask if I could be healed or I could be free of my pain. And the devil will reach over and whisper in your ear, but that don't work for you. You know what he means, don't you, David? <laughs> David gave his testimony last Sunday. Fourteen months he had been down with back trouble. Fourteen months he had been hurting. And two or three weeks ago, whatever it was, or four, whatever it was, he finally came up and said, Thurman, I've been suffering for 14 months with back pain. I think it's time that I got you to pray for me. I reached up and if I had, I mean, I had to keep the love of God in my heart. I wanted to reach up as my brother in Christ and shake him and slap him three times and say, where have you been? What have you been thinking about? <laughs> Y'all understand where I'm coming from. That's how the devil deceives us. I mean, I said, what? David, you've been here so many times, and you've been suffering for 14 months? And he said, yes. I said, well, I wanted to reach over and slap him on the back, but I laid it on him gently <laughs> and rebuked that pain. He commanded to be healed in the name of Jesus, and he left up there, and he didn't get to the back of the church till he was healed. Hallelujah. Isn't that awesome? God is wonderful. I mean, he, I mean can, can you imagine what the devil has done to us? Here the Lord makes these blatant statements. Ask. Well, then what's wrong? I guess we don't ask. Ask, and it shall be given. Oh, but that's everybody but you. Anita, that's everybody, but, or David, that's everybody but you. I know all these other people over here getting healed, but you know he ain't going to do that for you. Think how wicked old guy you are, or think about how wicked an old woman you are, or whatever. He'll do everything he can to deceive you, to get you to not ask in faith. Or you start to ask, and you say, oh, you remember when you were 14 years old when you committed this sin? And when you were 15 when you did that? And 17 when you did this? And 18 when you did that? Now, you don't really think God would do anything for an old wicked critter like you. See, so you got to know. Yeah, I did all them things, devil. But I repented. And God put them as far as the east is and the west, and he don't even remember them's ever been done. So it's done, devil. In the name of Jesus, I'm just as if I had never sinned in my life. I've been justified by the blood of Jesus. Isn't that amazing? He makes these awesome statements. Ask, 
and it shall be given you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For, and I guess that's got to be a misprint. Every other one, not every one. Every other one. Not, not, it couldn't be everyone that asked could get their answer. It couldn't be, could it? Yes, it is. Well, then why don't we, why when we ask him something, well, what, first of all, if there's something wrong with us, I mean, I got an email today from a lady, and she said, uh, Thurman, uh, we got one of your CDs, and my husband listened to it with me. <laughs> and when you made the statement, if you're sick or if you've got a problem, you got sin in your life because sickness comes from sin. He said, he said, that guy's crazy. I mean, every time you see somebody sick, that don't mean they got sin in their life. Yes, it does. You don't realize what sin is. I didn't realize what sin was. If you want to be made sick, all you got to do is step over into sin. And I mean, some of the things that you think is not even sin in God's sight is a blatant sin. And it'll open the door wide open. And the only problem is you don't know what they are, but the devil does. And when you step into that sin, I mean, the day I really got a hold of what sin was, was about 20 something years ago when I had first begun to walk in divine health. And I'm learning these things. And the devil knows I'm learning these things, so he's watching me extremely close with his fiery darts. Ephesians 6, 16, fiery darts. One day, a man brought a piece of paper in and said, have you read this? I said, well, I don't know. He handed it to me, and this is what it said. If certain things were to happen in our company, they might have to close the engineering division. And I, out of my mouth, made this statement. Gee, if they close the engineering division, I wonder what would happen to me. Now, does that sound like a blatant sin? Not to most people, but let me tell you, it is. Why is it? As Christians, who are we supposed to trust as our provider? The Lord. Who was I trusting? My company. That's right. And so when I voiced that, I sinned, and in one heartbeat, I went from totally well to a splitting migraine headache with sinus fluid pouring out of both nostrils that quick. That's how fast it happened. Isn't that awesome? Isn't that amazing? I mean, the guy that was standing there looking at me, he said, good grief, Thurman, did a river just break loose in your head? And I said, no, that's okay. You wouldn't understand if I told you. But he walked off, and I repented. I said, Lord, I am so sorry that I didn't trust you as my provider. I said, Lord, I don't care what happens to this company. I don't care if this engineering division closes this whole company folds. I know you're going to take care of me. I don't work for them. I work for you. I am a child of the king. You're my God. You're my Lord. You're my father. You're my provider. And if everything in the world fell apart, you could still, you could send the ravens to feed me if you wanted to. I don't have to have nobody but you. I said, Lord, I'm so sorry. I said, now, Lord, that I've repented with technically with tears. I mean, I mean, I was hurting so bad. I had tears in my eyes. I mean, my headache was busting. I mean, I had a migraine headache like I've ne virtually never had, but it was really hurting. And then I began to say, you devils of hell, come out of me in the name of Jesus. I rebuke you and command you to leave. And let me tell you, they were very rebellious. They did not come out. All day long, I continued to rebuke the devil and command him to come out. I'd be walking through the place and I'd say, you devils of hell, come out of me in the name of Jesus. And somebody hear me and say, Thurman, what's wrong with you? You okay? Yeah, I'm okay. But I got a devil in me now, and I, ha I hadn't been able to kick him out yet. Oh, my gosh. This guy's, this guy's lost his mind. No, I was living in a world where most of them had no knowledge of. I mean, I stepped over into this world. I understood this world a little. But the average Christian, your brothers and sisters in Christ, have no knowledge of what I'm telling you. Now, this, is, this is common stuff. You know, these are basic principles of the kingdom, and people don't even know it. And we're supposed to go on 
past this basic stuff and get into the meat of the word. Well, let me tell you, most of us are not even ready for milk. Paul tells that's what these people were. He told said, you know, you ought to be ready to teach others and you're, you gotta be taught yourself. He said, you're still, you ought to be ready for the meat of the word. You're, you're not, I have to feed you with milk. He said, because you're not getting in the word. You don't understand what's going on. Well, that's the way we are today. That's the way I was. So, I mean, every day I rebuilt these devils, commanded them to leave me, and day and night, and no luck. The fourth day, I am intently involved in a warfare battle. I have not asked for healing at all. I am rebuking the devil and commanding him to leave because I know that when I sinned, I opened a door and a demon came in me and that's what made my head split open. And I know that devil's inside there pounding on my head. I know he's the one that's filled up my sinuses and they're just a flooding out. In fact, that third night, I guess it was, <clears throat> when I woke up in the middle of the night so much that old brown fluid had run out of my head all over the pillow. It had gotten in my eyes and stuck all over me and I woke up and I couldn't see. I, I said, what is this? I got up and went to the bathroom, turned the warm water on, began to wash my face till I got all that stuff off of me. I mean, it was awful what that devil was doing to me. And I'm gonna tell you, the average person, when you tell them what you're fighting, they don't believe this. This couldn't possibly be a demon. Well, I knew it was a demon. But anyway, the fourth morning on the way to work, I began to quote every scripture I knew, like 1 John 3, 8, Hebrews 2, 14, Colossians 2, 4, 13, 14, and 15, Luke 10, 19, and 20, Mark 16, 17, and 18. I began to quote those. I had those hidden in my heart way back yonder. And as I quoted all those scriptures, and then I quoted Luke 10, 19, and 20, which Jesus said, behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Nevertheless, rejoice not in this that the evil spirits have to be subject to you, but rather rejoice because your name's written in heaven. I said on behalf of that, you devil of hell, you foul evil spirits of infirmity that have come in me to mess up my head and put this sinus on me, I am commanding you in the name of Jesus to come out of me. And I mean, I was screaming much louder than that. And I, after I'd screamed that, I'm in my truck on the way to work. And I said, you devil of hell, come out of me and go now. And I reached over and hit the dash of my pickup and said, go. And when I did, whoo, and I was instantly healed. No headache, no sinus. My head was totally dry and totally open. And I thought, wow, Lord, this is awesome. And I sat there for a couple of seconds and how wonderful it is to be able to breathe and no headache. And all of a sudden, that great big placard, that marquee or whatever you want to call it, I saw in the heavenlies. It said in Matthew eleven twelve. I said, Lord, I have read that scripture a hundred times until today I have never understood what that scripture meant. But now I know that scripture in Matthew eleven twelve 12 says, Since the coming of John the Baptist, the kingdom of heaven, which is in you and me, has suffered violence. But the violent take it by force. Did I take that demon out of that woman, little Karen, standing here the other night by saying, Mr. Demon, would you please come out of her? No, no I did not. I was screaming at that beast and screaming the blood of Jesus and say, you devils of hell, you will come out of her. And that devil in her was screaming right back at me saying, we're not coming out. And they wasn't very nice, was they? So for those of you that were here and heard what that demon says, you're in a war and you got to treat them devils rough. And that's why I say, some of you women some of you are not that well trained. Some of you women don't have that boldness in you. And so these, you know, y'all are, unfortunately, God made y'all different. You know, you're a little bit more frail than us old wicked tough guys, you know. You know, we get out there and we work and most of you ladies are gentle and calmer and softer 
and everything. And until you get hardened to demons, most of you better stay away from demons. Yeah. Well, I mean, okay, you can be soft and gentle and then be strong and violent with demons. Amen. Now, you better learn how to do that. Now, then, if you will learn how to do that, then you can be just as bold and violent and quote the word. But, you know, I can think of many times I've dealt with women whenever, you know, I hear I'm doing warfare, commanding demons to come out of somebody. And before I learned, you had to get them to repent. And I might be there two, three, four, five hours. I used to do this. And then all of a sudden, you get tired after two, three, four, five hours. And then you say, ma'am, would you take a turn? And the woman would say, Mr. Demon, would you please come out? <laughs> See, that's where women live, you know. I mean, you know, most of the women, most of the women, you know, us hard guys, you know, some guy, you comes in, he's done something for you, and you say, hey, I don't like the way you do that. You need to do that over. Okay, Thurman, no problem, I'll do it over. But if some woman is doing something for you, and she kind of says, hey, I, I don't like the way you did that. Do that over. Ah, she cried, you're so mean to me. I got to learn, hey, you don't talk to women like you talk to men. You talk to them gentle, you know, or you make them cry. You got to be gentle with ladies. You know, they're not made like men. See, I worked around men too long. I mean, men don't think nothing about that. You know, that's just the way we talk to each other. But women, you don't talk to women like that. You know, so when you got women working for you, you have to learn how to do everything all over. You got to learn to be nice and gentle to the girls. So, and you get things done if you're nice and gentle to them but you don't ever jump on one of them's case. You know, you're nice and gentle to the ladies. Well, but demons, you, if you get a woman like you, or Anita, some of you, or Cheryl, now is learning these things, and now some of y'all are really learning, and you gotta realize you gotta get as mean with a demon as you can do with anybody. I mean, you got to be forceful with demons. And I got forceful and mean with that demon but you got to realize, I didn't kick him out in one day. Somebody said, well, I commanded the demon to come out of me and nothing happened. Well, don't give up. Hang in there. You know, because you, you may get a mean one like I did. Four days the beast stayed there. Four days before I kicked him out. And when I finally got so violent with him, he had to leave. But Jesus said in Matthew eleven twelve. 12, since the coming of John the Baptist. That's when the kingdom came. That's when Jesus came. He says, the kingdom of heaven, which is in you, has suffered violence. So where do you think we suffer violence from? From the devil. So how do we kick him out? We repent, and then we kick that devil out with the word of God. And if he don't go away quickly, you don't want you've repented of your sins, just like the other night, Sunday night, with Karen standing here, if I'd have just said, you devils come out of her one time, and she'd have broke and got violent, started screaming, and if I'd have been intimidated and turned her loose, there is no telling what would have happened in this place. But she might have hurt somebody, but she was not in control of herself. But the demons were in control of her. So have we seen anything like this in the scripture? Oh, yeah, it's all over the place. You know, so it's nothing new. It's nothing new. You've got to understand these things. Do, do, do you have another statement you want to make there? Well, sometimes I, I wasn't going to make this statement, but I'll add this. When uh, I had it, it on. Yeah, no, it's on. Oh, it's on. Oh, Dave, you got it turned it up? Yeah, it is. Uh, okay. He, oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I did have a, a long time ago a woman who, uh, a, it, it was a beast or a principality that came in her, and she flopped up and down like a fish, and I had called her husband because she uh, would not hold, she bit my hand and all kinds of things. But um, she would have sued me if I had, if her husband hadn't been there and he said, you need to get down on your knees and thank her what, what she did for you and getting that, deep, that beast out of you. But the, uh, now I know to uh, command that beast to shrink a million times smaller than it is. 
so I command it to shrink and I strip it of its power. But you know, you have a few times like that where the woman was flopping up and down mm -hmm. like a fish mm -hmm. in the room or on, mm -hmm. on the couch and then the floor and she uh, bit me and her husband too. But I just thank God that I called him to come and I didn't even know why I was doing that because she hadn't manifested that yet. But I just said, I think you ought to sit in tonight. Well, that was the Holy Spirit. Oh yeah, yeah. But what yeah. I wanted to tell you was even in warfare, uh, a long time ago, there was this a young girl that I just uh, wanted to help get, grow in the Lord and I loved her and her, her parents were friends of mine. And she was not walking with the Lord, she and this young guy. And I was in the prayer room uh, just praying for her. And all of a sudden I said, Satan, you are not having her. You cannot have her. And I just screamed much louder than I did then at the top of my lungs. And I said, you are not getting uh, Stacy. You are not getting David. They're going to walk with God. And I uh, quoted scripture. They were going to... Uh, live godly lives and serve the Lord and they did and I you know all of a sudden they straightened up they got married mm -hmm. had they have four kids and they're on the mission field mm -hmm. the four the kids are but uh, I, I remember and I know that's what that's the scripture why I screamed because anybody else would have thought I was completely lost my mind but I was screaming at the devil at the top of my lungs but he heard me and he let loose those two yeah. young kids if you really want to kick the devil out when you really get violent like that I've now learned some things that I didn't know 20 years ago but now then I've learned that you when you go to Hebrews 4 16 and you go to the throne of grace which is in the third heaven, you're above Satan and his host, and he has to obey you. I mean, from up there, I'm gonna tell you, 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 yeah, I didn't know about that then either, but I'm telling you now, I've seen demons that I used to couldn't get out, now then I can go to the throne of grace, and if I can stay at the throne of grace, I can whisper, demon, come out of her, and man, they'll just fall and they'll come out. Used to when I used to scream and everything else and nothing happened. But it's all dependent upon your faith level, your knowledge of the word. And when you get there, I mean, you know, I mean, I wouldn't have thought about doing these things a few years ago. But I can remember the first demon, the Lord took me to a house of a man that when the demon manifested in the man and he just drew his face up. He didn't say a thing. He just drew his face up and his eyes turned green and got about that big around. And I was scared. I had no idea what I was dealing with. That was my first experience with a demon in a man. And I mean, the, and of course the thing about it was, I knew I was there according to God's will because I was out of town visiting in another church and I was sitting there and all of a sudden the Lord spoke to me. I hear his audible voice. He said, son, after church today, I want you to go over to see John Doe. I won't call the man's true old true name. And I thought, goodness, Lord, I'm that old guy, he's an old bachelor, he lives by himself. It's Sunday, he's probably over to Toddy House drinking whiskey or something, Lord. He won't be at home. And about five minutes later, the Lord says, now, son, after church today, I want you to go see John Doe. And then a third time he said it. Why does he tell us guys three times because we're so dense you know I mean it's so amazing how dense we are as men I mean that's God knows that's why he tells so for you women that have trouble with your husband tell him the first time and then go up and look him right now and tell him the second time and then grab him by the shoulders and shake him and tell him the third time and he might get it if you're lucky maybe he'll remember what you said you know so that's just the way us men are now, some of you girls you know if you haven't told us three times at least and we don't hear you, you know, that's what I tell Cheryl. She said, what do you mean you didn't know I was going to go do this this afternoon? I told you three times yesterday. I said, I don't remember a single thing you said. She knows, don't you, honey? <laughs> She's done that. And I'm not, you know, I'm doing something else. She said, honey, I want to tell you that. I said, okay. She said, you listening? Yeah, yeah, I'm listening. And I'm thinking about something else. And she gets through, she said, you hear me? Yeah, I got it. Okay. And I didn't hear a thing she said. I thought I did, but I didn't until something happened. You know, I mean, I'm, you, we got too many things on our mind. We have to stop and think. But when you do that, when I went there to that man's house and 
I sat down with him. Of course, I didn't think he had been at home. I really didn't. But I walked up to the door, and he was at home Sunday afternoon, right after church. Don't you know God knew that the guy's going to be there? That's why he told me to go over there. So I went over there and knocked on the door, and he came to the door. And he said, oh, Thurman, what are you doing here? I said, well, I'm passing through town, and I was going down to Mom and Dad's house to visit them. And uh, I said, I happened to stop here at this little, this little town at church because church time come, and it was Sunday morning, so I just wanted to go to church today. And I said, I just thought while I was in town, I'd stop by and visit you. He said, well, what are you going to talk to me about? I said, well, I come over here to talk to you about Jesus. And he looked at me and he said, Thurman, <clears throat> I've known you for a lot of years. He said, there's not a preacher in this town come to this door and said, I want to talk to you about God. I'd kick him out. But he said, I know you. And he said, you didn't drink. You didn't cuss. You didn't run around with wild women. You didn't do nothing. You walked in obedience to that word. I don't know a man in this town that I'd listen to about Jesus but you. He said, I'll listen to what you got to say. He said, come in. I thought, isn't that amazing? And I went in there that day, and I sat down, and I thought, oh, God, what do I, what do I say? So I just laid my Bible down and let it drop open, and it dropped open to John chapter 1. And I thought, well, this will be a good place to start. And so I started reading. I read one chapter of the book of John, and I'm sitting here facing this way. He's sitting in a chair over there facing this way. And at the end of chapter 1, I kind of looked up at him, and when I did, he was sitting there with his face drawn, teeth like this, jaws all clenched, eyes this big and green as they could be. And I thought, what is wrong with him? I mean, I'm a Baptist. Nobody ever told me about this. Well, let me tell you, it scared my socks off. All he had had to do to jump up and said, I'm going to get you. And let me tell you, I'd have made a, I'd have made a new door in that house somewhere. I don't know where. <laughs> but that's what I didn't know any better, see. So if you've been where I've been, then praise God. You know, I, I didn't know nothing. You know, I guarantee I'd have made another door to the side of that house somewhere if he'd have just jumped up and said, boo. I, I certainly didn't know who I was in Christ. I, I mean, we can laugh about these things, can't we, Mike? We've all been there. But that's why we study the Bible today so that don't happen to us. So we get prepared. So we see who these things are. We know who we are. We know what kind of power we have over them. So after about four chapters of the book of John, the Lord and the Word of God delivered that man from that demon, and that man got saved a little later down the road. And then right after he got saved, three months after he got saved, he dropped dead with a heart attack in a service station in that little town he was living in. And because I had prayed for that old guy, God had heard my prayer, and I said, Lord, if it's possible, could you let me be the laborer? I just, I so, I, I love that old guy. He used to come down to me work on his truck and everything when I was a young mechanic. And I said, Lord, I just, I mean, he, I walk in the door, blankety blank Thurman, how are you doing today? You know, how's the SOB truck of mine? You know, this GD SOB. And I say, you know, I, I, I need to talk to you. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, could you talk to me and not use all them foul words? Oh, Thurman, you know, you blankety blank SOB, GD this. I said, I'll, I'll fix your truck, I'll fix your truck. <laughs> I just tried to love him. I mean, that's just the way he lived. You know, he was just, to take God's name in vain, was just a normal way of life for him. He'd walk up to you and say, how in the GD things going today? You know, I mean, that's, that's the way he talked all the time. You know, stop out and get him a fifth of whiskey, you know, and drink a couple of swigs. And, well, how's them SOBs doing out there today? I mean, that, that, that's the way he talked. And to think that God allowed me to go by. And of course, he was full of demons. I didn't know. So when I went by and read the word to him, after I prayed and asked the Lord to do this, he sent me, because I asked him, you know, if I could be the one send me. Well, he did. And of course, the Lord took his word, delivered him, and then got him saved. And three months later, he had a heart attack and died. And that man went to heaven. That man got washed in the blood. That guy was in his mid-60s you know, and had been cheated by the devil all those years. And I am so grateful I got to be the one to lead him to Christ. What a privilege. Wow. But demons, you know, you got to realize who these beasts are and what they're doing to us. 
they come to steal, kill, and to destroy. But the Lord says here, ask and it shall be given you. Ask, seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you for everyone, not someone, but everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. So if you won't have knowledge or something about the Word of God, you begin to ask, seek God, and get in the Scriptures, and He'll either take you to the right place here, or He'll put you with a man or a woman that knows the answers. He'll give you that. Then it says here, <clears throat> Or what man is there of you, whom if his son asks bread, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks a fish, will he give him a serpent or a snake? Now, you wouldn't do that to your children, would you? No. So he says, if you then, if you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father, which is in heaven, give good things to them that ask him? See, this is the thing we miss about God. We look at God like he's a human being, that he thinks like you and I do, that he's unstable. You know, I mean, you know, give me a break. You know, you can, <clears throat> I hate to tell this, but Cheryl said after we got married about a couple months, she said, you know, you have busted my bubble. Until I married you, I thought you were perfect. <laughs> now I realize you're a man, like all the rest of you make mistakes. <laughs> But see, I can hide things from some of you, but when you live with something day in and day out, you can't hide nothing, see. You make mistakes, you do things. I mean, then they find out who you really are. Yeah. Do what, honey? Oh, okay. <laughs> praise the Lord. She's trying to build me up now. She said, I'm wonderful. Okay, well, praise. I received that. <laughs> but the thing about it is, we are human. You know, and we, we have to realize that, I mean, it, it, that, but Cheryl did say that because she said after about two or three months, she said, I really thought just what I saw you at church, you were the holy walker. You never made a mistake. You never sinned. She said, I could never envision you ever sinning or nothing. But then when we got married and been married a while, she realized I don't do everything perfect. I try, but you know, I do make mistakes. You know, once in a while, somebody will do something that rubs me wrong, and you know, I can get a little angry if I ain't careful. <laughs> well, Lord, help me. <laughs> oh, some of y'all, some of y'all do the same things. <laughs> We're human beings, you know. I mean, it takes something to walk into God kind of love. You know that? It takes something. But, so that's the way we perceive God. We don't perceive Him like God. We think God is like us. And let me tell you, he's not like us. And I am so grateful he's not like us. Because whenever he doesn't lose his cool, he's the same all the time. It doesn't matter what I do. I mean, there may be times that, you know, I would want to reach down and grab me by the nap of the neck and thump me one time with a great big finger from God. But he'll reach down and pat me on the head and I'll say, son, you need to straighten your act up down there. I love you, but I want you to straighten up. You know, bad things does not come from God. It only comes from the devil. You know, so God is so good and he's so awesome that we don't understand who he is. I don't understand him. I'm going to tell you, with all the miracles and the healings and everything else I've seen, which I've had the privilege to see many, I still know. I, I, I'm beginning to understand a little what Paul said. He said, I consider everything I have in this world as dung or refuge. I only want to know Christ and him crucified. I want to understand Christ better. Well, that's, that's what I want. I want to know the king better. So if I could walk like he walked, then there would be no limitations of his power he would share with me. And that's when I love it. I mean, I, I love seeing that lady walk out of the bed last night. I mean, I love Dr. Uh, Young. We just prayed over a few months ago. I mean, he had fell out of a tree and broke his back. And I, it happened on Tuesday. And I, he called me on Sunday night. And I got to pray the prayer of faith for him. 
Now, he had already been to a hospital, had a CT scan, and confirmation his back was broken. And I prayed the prayer of faith for him at 10 o'clock on Sunday night on the telephone, and he was up there close to Salt Lake City, Utah, and whatever that little suburb is right there in the edge of Salt Lake City. And the God we serve, the king of the universe, instantly healed that doctor of a broken back. I mean, the next day, this, somebody said, well, how do you know that? Well, because the next day he flew me and Cheryl out there and we went out there and spent two days with them in their home. And I, we walked with him. We walked all over the place with him and his wife and children. We walked up mountains. We walked up uh, elevator, I mean, the stairways. We walked down the stairways. We went out to eat together. We spent two days and nights with, in, in their home. So let me tell you, and everybody that was there that worked for him, that knew him, all knew he had a broken back. And the first thing all of them said when we saw them is, Gary, how are you walking? Hey, I mean, it's confirmation to us. We saw this thing happen. And I got to pray the prayer of faith for that guy over the telephone and see Jesus Christ instantly heal him. Isn't it wonderful to see Jesus do all these wonderful things? And ask and you shall receive, right, David? Ask. Yes. Amen. So if you got a problem, don't suffer with it. You know, repent of your sins and come to God in faith. You know, don't listen to the devil. The Lord says there, ask him. Therefore, and look at verse 12. Therefore, a few things, whatsoever you shall ask. Therefore, what? All things whatsoever you would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them, for this is the law and the prophets. What is that trying to say? Love your neighbor as yourself. Is that what that's trying to say? Love your neighbor as yourself. If you walk in the God kind of love, you will love your neighbor as yourself. Now then, if you walk in the God kind of love, and you treat everyone as your neighbors, and you treat them like God would treat them in a love, and you love yourself, then, you see what he's saying? Then up, from up above, he says, then ask anything, and I'll do it for you. Seek, and it's open. What if you say, well, Lord, I'm doing, I'm asking, and I'm knocking, and I'm seeking, but, Lord, that, you know, that Anita Snow woman, you know, you know that, well, I just can't stand that woman, Lord. You know, do you know, do anybody know Anita Snow? And I can't stand that woman. And somebody says, are you walking in the God kind of love? Well, yeah, but you know Anita, she just drives me up a wall. Is it going to do any good for me to ask God for anything, Anita? I don't think so. No, you're absolutely right. Here I'm talking evil about Anita. You know, now then, it, you know, we should, it doesn't matter what anybody does to us, we should still love them, right? I mean, you know, I, I mean, let's say Anita had a bad, I'm, she's a pastor anyway. I'm picking on her tonight. That's okay. She's had a bad day today, say. Does everybody have bad days once in a while? Amen. Amen. Every, and she's had a bad day and everything's gone wrong. I mean, the car's broke. They stumbled over the dog three times. The kids have done everything wrong. Ain't nobody done nothing right. And all of a sudden, she's at the edge of her wit's edge, and she is ready to scream and pull her hair out. And some of y'all been there, haven't you? Well, now if I walk up and say, hi, Anita, how are you doing? She's like, oh, it's terrible. <laughs> Ooh, well, golly, if that's the way you're going to be then. Well, see, am I supposed to love her during that? Yes. Sure. Please. The same way that I do when she's good to me. You know, the same way. Because that's what God told us to do. And then if you treat everybody like that and walk in that God kind of love, if you walk in that, that's when he goes back up and says, ask and it shall be given to you. Seek and you shall find. But what if I'm not willing to walk in that God kind of love? Oh, then he says, oh, well, you didn't read all the books, son. Yeah, you read the part where it says ask. Okay, Lord, I'm asking. I, I need this and I need that. And he says, mm -hmm. my ears all closed. I said, my ears open to them that are walking righteous before me. It's closed to those. That, but Lord, oh, he said, I oh, seem like you didn't love your wife yesterday. She tried to get you to do something, and you was not very nice to her. 
Oh, but Lord, you don't know what she did to me. He said, it doesn't make any difference what she did to you. I told you to love your wife. So what do you got to do? Lord, you mean I got to love her with all the things she did to me? He said, no, you don't have to. Only if you want me to hear you. That's what you got to do. You don't have to love her, you know. But you can either hear, let the devil hear you, and he's going to get you. So if you love your wife, then I'll hear you and keep the devil off your back. Okay, that makes it a whole lot easier to love your wife, doesn't it? Makes it a whole lot easier, see. But, I mean, I can use Cheryl and I as an example, of course, because, you know, we love each other. We really do. You know, so the thing about it is, by telling you this, I'm trying to get a point across to you, letting you know that God give us all these blank checks. But down at the bottom, he tells you what to do to make the blank checks work. That's just like one time I was reading in the scripture where it says, you know, if they won't do what, uh, I forget exactly where that scripture's at, but it talks about if they don't do something right, then just treat them as a sinner. You know, just treat them as a sinner. And so I asked the class, I said, so what, would you, what do you think that means, treat them like a sinner? He said, wow, I don't want to have nothing to do with them. The class said, man, if they're sinners, I mean, I don't, want to, I don't even want to get close to them. Yeah, I'm not going to say nothing to them. I said, you know, God tells us to treat the sinners with more love and respect than we do each other's brothers and sisters in Christ. Because we're already Christians. And I said, you can't win somebody to Christ. And the other day, just like Sharon said the other day, I said something about loving somebody, and she said something, and, and she realized immediately that wasn't God. She, she, the Holy Spirit convicted her, and she said, uh-oh, Lord, I blew that one. She said, I'm going to walk in the God kind of love from this day forth. He really got you on that one, didn't he, Sharon? But see, we, she learned right there how easy it is to step out of that love walk. But see, Sharon, she's like everybody else in here. She wants to get her prayers answered just like we want to get ours answered. And since God's no respecter of persons, you get out of that God kind of love walk. Then he says up here, it don't do no good for you to ask. It don't do no good for you to seek. It don't do no good for you to knock. I am not listening until you get right with your neighbors, your wives, your husbands, your children. You walk holy and you treat them you love them. Does that mean I can't talk evil about them? Yeah, that means you can't talk evil about them. Yeah, if you want to get your prayer answered. And I love getting my prayers answered, don't you? So see, the requirements are all here. <clears throat> then verse 13 says, enter you in at the straight gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Does that appear to be the average world that we live in today? Think about this. Verse 14 says, because straight is the gate and narrow is the way that leads into life. And few there be that find it. Now, I want you to think about this. When he says straight and narrow is the way that leads to life. How many of you want to live to be an old, healthy person? Do you know there is requirements to do that? And do you know the other day, I've, only a couple of weeks ago on Sunday afternoon, I taught for the first time in my life on the meat of the word. And some of the scriptures I taught from the meat of the word, there's people told me when that service was over, they said, Thurman, I can't go there with you. I cannot believe what you said from the scriptures, but yet I read the scriptures to them. Well, that tells me where we are. What does he say? How, how narrow is this way that leads to life? Very narrow. And how many is going to find it? Very few. 
Now then, think about this. The pathway that leads to life. You know, we don't get the meaning of that, the pathway that leads to life. Jesus made you a statement in 2 Timothy 1.10 that if there's anybody in this place tonight that can grasp that in its fullness, you're, I've never seen a human being that can grasp that scripture and what it says. I want you to think about that. This is meat. 2 Timothy 1.10. I want you to read that, and I want you to see what this says. I read this over and over and over and over and over, and it says exactly what it says. You can't read it no other way. But I think how many times I read it, and I just read over it like a novel. It didn't mean nothing until I really started walking with God and learning what it is for the king to come and give me life and give it to me abundantly. To give me life, eternal life. I have never met a human being that could walk where this scripture says. We read it, but we don't believe it. Think about what this says. But is now made manifest. When? Now, not tomorrow, not when we get to heaven, but now is made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ. Has he already been here? Oh yeah, oh, yeah he's been here. Who hath abolished death? Who's done what? Oh, yeah. He's abolished death? And hath brought life, brought what? Life, life and immortality to light through the gospel. Now I know we'll have immortality when we get to heaven. When we all get to heaven. I know things are going to be great when we all get to heaven. Is that what we do in the church? Yeah, it's going to be okay when we all get to heaven. Yeah, that's right. It's always, yeah, in the future, the past or something, but never now what the scripture says. You know, if you believe this scripture right here, if you really believe this scripture, nobody would ever say, well, that just tickles me to death. No. Nope. You know, because you take that word death. You know who the author of death is? The devil. the devil, of course. The devil is the author of death. God is the author of life. <clears throat> and life more abundantly. So now then, why do people go around saying, well, I guess I better start planning for my burial. I got a plan. You know, I'm 50 years old. You know, I got to go buy me a, a burial spot. You know, and I got a plan. Got to have insurance. You know, got to make sure that there's enough money for my kids to bury me when I die. And, I mean, are you planning to die? No. I mean, p people tell me people are not planning to die. Sure they are. They're planning to die. Why do you think people die? Because they don't believe this scripture. I'm telling you, this is meat right here to chew on. I mean, this stuff right here will be a T-bone steak, and it'll be an old country cow that's been on a range because it ain't going to chew up and dissolve easy, and it ain't going to go down easy, I guarantee you. You get a hold of what he just said there. He wrote the book. I didn't write this book. That book says, but is now made manifest. by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who has already abolished death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Is that a pretty, is that a mouthful? That's awesome mouthful. Now then, I have never seen a human being to this day that could comprehend and grasp that scripture because if they did, they would never, ever talk about nothing but life. Somebody says, how long are you going to live? I'm going to say, praise God, I'm going to live till I'm satisfied. Now, wait a minute now, Thurman. You know you, you, know you don't have the say-so of when you die. Well, I said, you know, though I do have. That's just like today, I walked into the post office. <clears throat> and there's a line like I've never seen in the post office. And so I'm standing there with all my stuff, 
getting ready to put it in the mail. I got about eight or ten things going to foreign countries, so I got to pay for them there. Everything else we do at the minister center, so I just hand them across the counter. I get up there, and one of the ladies behind me, she says, I'm taking all this stuff out and going to Ghana and to wherever, all the different places it's going. She says, wow, you sure sending a lot of stuff to foreign countries. What is it? She said, I see the name on it, to Living Savior Ministries. Do, are you a, have a church? I said, oh, yeah. She said, what's, what's all that about? I said, life. How to be healed. How to walk in divine health. I said, I've learned how to walk in divine health. I've learned how to get people healed. And the little woman behind her, which had two or three or four kids standing around her, she said, well, all I got to say, I'm a Christian too, but I've lived with the same man for 15 years and raised four kids, and after that you need something because that was enough to make you sick. <laughs> I looked over at her and I said, ma'am, with that kind, of, that kind of words out of your mouth, I said, do you not know that Proverbs 18, 22 says life and death and the power of the tongue and every man and woman shall eat the fruit of their tongue? I said, you are condemning your husband and your children. I said, you know what should have come out of your mouth? You should have said, praise God, I'm a Christian. I got the best husband in town. He's a wonderful man and he's given me four beautiful children and them gifts from God. And we're going to do great things for the kingdom of God and we ain't never going to be sick. That should be her confession. But her confession is wrong. Now then, if she was to read this scripture, I guarantee I could take that woman and sit down and let her read that 20 times over and over, and she would not get the meaning of that scripture. You know how many times I read it before I got it? Ain't no telling. I meditated on that, and I meditated on that, and I said, God, if that says what that says, but is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior who has already abolished death and has brought life and immortality to life through the gospel. That means if I can believe it, I already don't have to worry about death no more. It's over. You've already defeated the beast. You've already given me immortality right now if I could do everything you say. And I thought, Lord, I can't take just one scripture like this. You told me not to build a doctrine on one scripture. I said, Lord, I need at least another one somewhere. So he gave me two more. I have a whole bunch more, but I'm just going to give you two in this evening's Bible study. I'm going to step back to John, and I want you to chew on these a little bit. John 8. And you'll have to definitely go chew on these. You know, this is, this is going to be something that's going to take some work. John 8, 51. Look at what the king says. In John 8, 51. And he even says, truly, truly, or verily, verily, I say unto you, if a man, if a man, if a man, keeps my sayings, he shall never see death. Is that an awesome statement? But there's a requirement. If a man keeps, or a woman keeps my sayings. Well, now how in the world are you going to keep God's sayings if you don't know everything in this book? You can't. You will have to meditate on this book day and night to walk in what he said do. And if you sin one time, the death process is going to start in your physical body. Did you know that we go from here to John 11? Over just a few more pages. And chew on this one. 11, 26. 25 and 26. And Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believeth thou this? No, you don't believe it. The reason we don't believe that, when we go back to 1 Corinthians, go to 1 Corinthians and I want to show you something. This book is so awesome in its makeup 
that when you really get to meditating on the Word and chewing on the real meat of the Word, this book is so awesome. 1 Corinthians, I think it's 1 Corinthians 3. 1 Corinthians 3, verse 21. I want you to think about what the king said right here. Now, like I say, this is a little meat mixed in with a little bit of milk tonight. You know, don't hurt for a man to have a glass of milk and chew up a little bit of meat in the process. But this will give you some meat with your meal tonight to think about. 1 Corinthians 3, 21. Therefore, let no man glory in men, for all things are yours. Now, as children of the king, what belongs to you? Well, and he elaborates on that in verse 22. Whether you're Paul or Apollos or Peter or the world or life or death or things present or things to come, all are yours. <clears throat> Is that a little bit of meat to chew on? If everything belongs to you, you better learn how to talk. Because if you don't learn how to talk and you don't study the word, then guess what? If you don't know the word, guess what you're going to talk? The devil's talk. Guess what you're going to believe? You're going to believe the thoughts the devil puts in your mind. Now then, if you're busy watching secular television and listening to secular radio, and all those things that they sew on there, all the songs and all the shows and the talk shows and the uh, soap operas and everything else that's on television, everything will teach you everything contrary to what the Word of God says. You'll virtually never see anything on the TV or secular radio that will glorify God or be in accordance with the Word of God. So since the world lives like that, that's the way you're going to live because you think that's the way that we're supposed to live. Well, that's not the way we're supposed to live at all. You think that if you want to be prosperous and successful, successful, you have to go to school and get you a good education, get you a degree somewhere where you can then find you a good job or go in business for yourself where you can be prosperous and successful. But the Word of God says if you hide the Word in your heart, meditate in it day and night, then your ways will be prosperous and then you will have great success. And how many people, I don't know a single person in my life that meditates in this book day and night like it says. I don't know one. Isn't that a shame? I don't even do it. And I know some of the answers and I don't do it either. Why? Because we get too involved in the things of the world. I mean, just like today. I guess most of the day today, I was heavily involved in spiritual things till about two o'clock. But about two o'clock, I finally got loose from everything I was doing, praying for people and everything else, after going to the mailbox and everything else, delivering all our packages, and then I went running out to the building that I'm building. I'm building a, uh, or Dave and I was building a, a building, a, like a tractor shed. It's 30 feet deep and 75 feet long and about 12 feet high. We're building that building. Well, I'm doing all the welding on it, and Dave, he's putting all the metal on it and everything, and we've got it about half, at least half finished. Well, I wanted to run out there today because I knew I had to get through from there. I had to leave there at least about 4 o'clock today to get home, get a shower, get dressed, and get down here by 6. So from 2 to 4, I was out there running 90 miles an hour, sawing metal, cutting metal, welding tubes together, doing all kinds of stuff. And I found it very difficult to pray without ceasing while I'm doing all that, while I'm measuring and cutting. I found it very difficult to pray and stay in constant communications with God. Every once in a while I'd stop and say, oh my goodness, Lord, last 15, 20 minutes I hadn't even thought about you. I'm more thinking about how I'm going to do this. Lord, forgive me. I'm not meditating on the Word. I'm too involved in my worldly stuff. Now, I know none of y'all have this problem but me. You know? I mean, it's not really hard to get up in the morning and not even say, Hi, Jesus, how are you doing? 
and get out on that traffic and fight an hour or 30 minutes worth of traffic and go to work and walk in and you fight the problems of life and you go to dinner and you uh, lunch and you come back to work and you work till six o'clock in the afternoon and you fight 30 minutes or an hour going home and you walk in and sit down and plop on down the TV and say, boy, am I tired. Somebody says, what did God do for you today? God who? <laughs> am I serious? Is that, I mean, sure. Did you pray today? Did you thank the Lord this morning for your breakfast? Did you thank him for your noon the meal? Did you thank him when you had that drink of water? Did you thank him when you went up to the water fountain? Did you praise him and thank him for that glass, of that drink of water? Oh, God, Lord, forgive me. I didn't, say, I didn't thank you for nothing today. Now, I'm, some of y'all probably been guilty of that today. See? Y'all saw where I'm coming from? But the Lord tells us we're supposed to thank him and praise him for everything. Pray without ceasing. That's his sayings. He said, if you do all of these things, if a man does all of these things, he won't ever have to die. You know anybody that does all those things? No. I had never met him. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Enoch and Elijah come the closest to two men that we know because they were both translated out. Enoch so pleased God after 350 years, God says, you know, you so pleased me, Enoch. He said, you know, I ain't used to stand down there in the earth. He just reached up and grabbed by the shirt and said, come on with me. Just jerked him right into the third heaven, translated him right into there. And Enoch was not. He could not be found because God took him to heaven. Well, now see, if God was pleased with Enoch and he translated him into heaven, if we will do the same thing and he's no respecter of person, guess what he'll do for us? Same thing. That's right. He'll translate us the same. But you notice he said, if a man keeps all of my sayings. Well, is it difficult to pray without ceasing? Yeah. Is it difficult to treat everybody with that God kind of love? Oh. Is, is that a little difficult? Oh. In other words, you almost run into some of the same people I do in the course of the day out there. <laughs> That's not God's way, Anita. I know what you're saying. I could love them at a distance a whole lot better than I can up close. Yeah, but you know, that's not the God kind of love. He lets us start over, too. Uh, <laughs> Every day, he lets us start over. Hey, hey, praise the king for that. Aren't we grateful, Michael? He lets us start over. But just think, these statements are so powerful in here. You, you, you and I have something to shoot for. Now, let's put it this way. The closer you can walk to that God kind of love. Now, I'm going to tell you, if any of you have seen or known a person that has literally walked in that God kind of love, and they got to be 95, and it wasn't hardly wrinkled, they were still, I mean, a woman, you know, she was such a godly woman. She walked in love. She never talked evil about nobody, and she was 95 years old. And still able to go and do all kinds of things. They said, my grandmother was the most awesome woman, but she never talked evil about nobody. She loved everybody. She loved all the grandchildren. Never found nothing wrong with none of them. She didn't talk about none of them. If she talked, she was saying something good about her grandbabies. And even her, me, her own son, it made no difference what I did. She had nothing but good to say about me. In fact, one day I asked her, I said, Grandma, you don't have nothing to say a bad about nobody. So what do you think about the devil? She said, all I got to say, son, he's always on the job. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? You know, good things. About, and then you wonder why grandma lived to be 95 and was really, now she's a Christian woman. Somebody said, well, I know, I had a grandma that's 95 and meaner in hell. <laughs> but probably she was wrinkled. You know, and everything. And another thing, too, if she was meaner than hell itself, who did she belong to? She belonged to the devil and not God. So when she might live to be 95, but she's not going to have the blessings and not going to have what a godly woman to have. Did you women, how many of you women in here, well, men too, would like to live on to be 80, 90, or 100 and have no wrinkles? Did you know that if we can take this word 
and walk in the God kind of love, the aging process technically stops. Amen. You believe that too? Absolutely. Well, if, if, if we, the, the Lord is opening the door to the scripture for us today to realize, in other words, think about this. That when I was a young man in the Baptist church, this was a little more than I could fathom. But if you'd have told me when I was uh, 20 years old, if one day, Thurman, you'll be able to stand and you'll be able to pray over the telephone for people that are thousands of miles away and see miracles happen. I'd have said, whoa, you must be talking about another person. But today I've seen that over and over and over. If you'd have told me, you'll be able to stand one day and in the name of Jesus and rebuke a tornado and see it instantly stop. I'd have, I'd have said, whoa, it must be a different Thurman than the one I know right now. And it was then. But now I've seen that several times. And I've not only seen it, but I've taught it to other people and seen them do it. Right. Not just one or two, but the other day that, that uh, testimony we got from that couple from California, that was, she, they've, been listening, they've been listening to our teaching for several months now, six months, and they were going to take a cruise and go to California, I mean, go to Hawaii. And said so the second day out, the sea got so rough that several of them, including the crew, was sick. And she said about, I think it was about the middle of the day when it was so rough, said my little 11-year-old son said, Mama, you remember what Pastor Thurman taught us from the Bible, that we have this dominion and power? With it? He said, don't you think it's time we went up on the deck? I'm going to take care of this today in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. <laughs> she said, my 11-year-old son with us went up on the deck and reached out and said, Satan, I take authority over you and begin to quote the word of God and said, you will stop this wind. You will stop this waves. And this trip is going to be smooth and we're going to enjoy it in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, for giving us power over the devil. And she said, the winds and waves never changed a bit. It just as rough as it was. He said, Mama, Thurman said after this, all we got to do is praise God to see our results. And he threw up his hands and began to worship and praise. She said, in 10 minutes, the ocean was as smooth as silk. 11-year-old boy. She said, I'm telling you, Thurman, I know God's going to use my son. I thought to myself, look to me like he's already using him. Is that what you say, Marcia? I ain't going to use him. He's using him. I mean, if that kid, 11 years old, stood up and rebuked that wind, she said the rest of our trip all the way to Hawaii and back on that ship was perfect. Did Jesus calm the storms? Did he tell us to anybody that believed in him we could do the same thing? Don't you think it's time we start believing the king? 